For many patients who test positive for COVID-19, symptoms improve or resolve within days to weeks. However, for some, symptoms persist for much longer. This is known as long COVID or post COVID-19. Symptoms of long COVID range in number and degree, but often include extreme fatigue, joint and muscle pain, and memory or concentration problems. Long COVID research is a developing area of investigation with many details not fully understood. What is the functional medicine approach to long COVID symptomology? And what are the most effective known interventions? I think the most important thing is that, you know, there's no magic bullet or magic diagnosis for long COVID. You know, I, I think we've seen over the last few years, people kind of bring that up, especially in the clinical offering space. Like, you know, there's one thing, one test, one drug, one this, one that, you know, we know in functional medicine that things don't work that way. Long COVID is no different. It, it There's no magical answer. You've got to just get to the work the way that we do. If you have a roadmap of all of the possibilities, it helps to narrow that. So I hope that this helps people kind of understand specific areas they need to look into if they're troubleshooting. In this episode of Pathways to Wellbeing, we welcome functional medicine expert and researcher, Dr. Elroy Vojdani, to discuss long COVID, its symptomology, and how personalized treatment plans that address root causes may help to manage this health disorder. Welcome to the show, Dr. Vojdani. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I think we're all talking about long COVID again, and someone like me, who's a primary care doctor, I really want to understand how can I look for patterns or predict the type of patient who might struggle with long COVID symptoms? Will you talk to us a little bit about um, the long COVID persistent symptomology and what determinants you have found that can suggest to the, pot the potential for this development of long COVID? Absolutely. You know, the, the most important skill for all of us in the in the clinical space is that really good history taking that relationship that we build with our patients. So to me, that's always the most important piece of data that I can gather when I'm trying to determine are we dealing with long COVID or not. And from a clinical perspective, the hallmarks of long COVID are greater than three months of a combination of fatigue, dyspnea on exertion or exercise intolerance, and some type of neurocognitive disturbance like brain fog. Um, oftentimes joint pain and muscle pain, myalgias will accompany that. But uh, I think those three are, are typically found in virtually everybody who's suffering from long COVID. So you gotta sit down, ask questions, make a timeline and put those pieces of uh, information together and say, is this a possibility or not? And if the answer is yes, then I think you continue down that uh, diagnostic line. Very helpful. And you have a recent publication in Viruses, and your research has investigated some of these potential biological factors that are involved in long COVID. And we know that might be viral persistence, reactivation of dormant viruses, autoimmunity, or disturbance in the gut microbiome. We're kind of doing a tour of the functional medicine matrix thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Will you elaborate briefly on some of these topics? And I think I'd like to start with gut dysbiosis and how this might be related to long COVID symptoms. Yeah, absolutely. So the article that was published in, in Viruses with my dad and Michael Maas was really meant to be um, a summary of where we were to date and, and a summary of a lot of the research and publications that we had up until that point. So kind of going back in time to where that research started, one of our, our bigger initial papers was published in Frontiers in Immunology in January 2021. What did, what did we do in that study? We took monoclonal antibodies against spike and nucleocapsid protein of SARS-CoV-2. And we did a cross-reactive uh, experiment with human tissue, basically trying to map out if essentially what the cross-reactive epitopes were between spike nucleocapsid and human tissue. The theory was at that point, to remind you, this is pretty early in the pandemic where we're doing this research, is that there is a significant autoimmune cascade that is triggered in a long, uh, in a, a significant portion of post-COVID patients that's contributing to their symptom set. And we found really striking cross-reactivity to certain tissues. One of them was mitochondrial tissue. Another one was thyroid tissue. 
uh, blood brain barrier, neurological targets, and then um, a uh, an, another big uh, cross reactive antibody um, that we saw there was tizanilin. So you know, it kind of brought up the idea that you know, in the post COVID state, you're dealing with an autoimmune component against maybe neurological tissue, mitochondria, explaining the fatigue, and then with the zonulin component the presence of intestinal permeability actually triggered by the viral infection itself. Uh, several papers have come out since then, um, continuing to argue that and also showing that there are specific dysbiotic pictures found in long COVID, post COVID, also particular dysbiotic pictures that would make someone more susceptible to a severe infection of COVID. Um, and, you know, uh, I think the most fascinating pieces of literature so far show antigen persistence in the mucosal barrier for post-COVID patients, meaning that uh, either infection or uh, production of, let's say, uh, spike or nucleocapsid can exist for years in the gut mucosa following the initial infection, which leads to that dysbiosis and leaky gut. So are we thinking that those who had a dysbiotic microbial environment before they had a COVID infection are at greater risk for having persistent symptomology. I, I, that's one of the theories for sure, that if you had intestinal permeability going into it, you know, this next hit to zonulin would represent a marked uh, expansion of that inflammatory cascading process in the gut, and then it would just keep rolling downhill from there. That is definitely one of the theories. Very interesting how you mentioned this autoimmune cascade that affected mitochondrial function and thyroid function. And of course, we'll see some remaining fatigue with those body systems affected. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think overall, the role of mitochondria, both directly damaged by COVID, may be damaged prior to the infection from COVID, and then also uh, damaged in an autoimmune perspective following that, uh, holding them back from being able to repair themselves, uh, in my mind is probably like the center of the multi-layered, uh, you know, onion that is long COVID here. Right. And on the same line, thinking of autoimmunity, let's say someone has an existing um, autoimmune thyroid disease. Are you seeing a worsening of those symptoms following COVID infection? Yeah, there, there's probably several I, I consider signature autoimmune diseases that prior, if they existed prior to the infection, you see a pretty dramatic heightening of the autoimmunity afterwards. Um, Hashimoto's would be one of them without question, Graves as well too. Um, inflammatory bowel diseases seem to have a very heightened uh, activity initially after the infection. Uh, and rheumatoid arthritis, I think, uh, tends to be flared quite a bit afterwards as well, too. Um, but Hashi's is definitely high up on that list. Yeah, that makes good sense. Will you talk through this um, viral persistence or viral reactivation? Does that mean that mm -hmm. other existing viral co-infections, I'm thinking, you know, EBV, things like that, that they are reactivated in the setting of COVID infection? Yeah. So th there's two potential scenarios. One would be SARS-CoV-2 viral persistence along with what's called super antigen activation. What does that mean? Uh, in certain individuals with uh, different immune genetic haplotypes, they seem to struggle with the ability to clear the SARS-CoV-2 infection, and they will get persistence of the infection for years. Again, studies saying that the antigens can be persistent in gut mucosa for two, two and a half years. There are studies that show uh, viral RNA present within T cells for several years following an infection as well. So there, there's one subgroup because of genetic weaknesses in a particular part of immune defense will end up with just a persistent COVID infection. Another subgroup will have the acute infection, clear it appropriately, but it will create enough of an immunological imbalance that latent viruses will have an opportunity to reactivate. Epstein-Barr virus being the one that we talk about the most, but HHV6 is also implicated in that as well. Certain studies in long COVID will argue that 60 to 70% of long COVID patients will have EBV reactivation which in the literature would be measured by the presence of an early antigen, an IgG early antigen to EBV. 
So it, it looks like a huge piece of people uh, that are suffering from long COVID have that, not, not the viral persistence portion of it, but actually the viral reactivation. So other viruses waking up following the infection. Wow, this is fascinating stuff. And I think all, all clinicians, we all have those patients that have this history of viral, all kinds of viral parts of their story. When we make the timeline, they've had all of these viruses. How can we prepare that type of patient knowing that COVID is a part of the ecosystem out there? Is there anything that we need to consider, any special considerations for that specific kind of um, persona almost? Yeah, I think the most important question to ask in that scenario is why was that individual so susceptible to a very common virus tipping things into such an uncontrolled place, right? So what do we know about that? And this is where I think functional medicine is perfectly suited to answer these questions because we're in the mindset of asking a why question from a whole body perspective and quite frankly, you know, very few other people are going to ask that question. So, you know, if you kind of dive in and, and look at why, let, let's say not in the long COVID state, but just let's say the general population, why are certain individuals so triggered by EVV and others aren't? There's a whole slew of explanations for that. There was an article that was published just a couple of weeks ago that showed specific immune haplotypes are incapable of dealing with an acute EBV infection. And it looks like those are the ones that are going to be susceptible to something like MS being triggered. But, you know, just open up the functional medicine tool book, uh, toolbox and you'll have all the other explanations for it. Somebody who had pre-existing immunological burden is going to be primed for EBV creating a problem where, where otherwise it wouldn't. So did they have intestinal permeability? Do Are they dealing with chronic emotional stress? Um, do they have some type of environmental toxin exposure? You know, all the things that we learn about in our functional medicine training pertain perfectly to this question. Yes, I can see clearly how functional medicine is particularly well suited to answer these questions. And thinking about all of the antecedents and triggers and mediators that might contribute to viral susceptibility or severity Let's start to layer on this piece of metabolic health. And will you help us understand how comorbidities, things like diabetes, obesity, how that can also potentially contribute to the development of long COVID? Absolutely. So this is going to involve us opening our biochemical uh, understanding uh, w once again. So uh, I think one of the earliest signals in the early days of the pandemic was that individuals with certain comorbid comorbidities were much more prone to severe COVID or life-threatening COVID. And, and since then, those same comorbidities have been um, known to be the same uh, uh, risk factors for the development of long COVID. And, and what are they? Primarily, you know, metabolic dysfunction, uh, obesity, I think, being at the top of the list. So, you kind of like break down um, obesity and you look at the mechanisms of viral defense and what are the connections between those two? In other words, how does an obese individual end up in a situation where their viral defense is inefficient for what it's being faced with and they're, they for, therefore will suffer the consequences of that? So in metabolic dysfunction, let's say insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, we have a situation in which cells are incapable of receiving adequate chemical energy into a cell. So their glucose transport from the plasma into a cell to be converted into ATP is dramatically hindered by the insulin resistance. The end result is that the mitochondria for those individuals are much more inclined to be running on aerobic glycolysis or anaerobic glycolysis, so aerobic gly sorry, anaerobic glycolysis instead of oxidative phosphorylation. So again, going back to kind of basic biochemistry, when someone is running on anaerobic glycolysis at the mitochondrial level, the amount of ATP that they produce per molecule that comes in is dramatically less. They're producing two to four ATP versus when somebody is working through oxidative phosphorylation, they're getting somewhere between 30 to 36 ATP. So huge differences in the amount of 
uh, cellular energy being produced for amount of food energy coming in, essentially. Now, mitochondria are extremely fascinating in that the amount of energy produced um, will actually dramatically change the balance of reactive oxygen species being produced at the mitochondrial level. In other words, for a mitochondria to go through anaerobic glycolysis to have to produce those two ATP, there are massive amounts of reactive oxygen species that are going to be produced at the mitochondrial level compared to someone who is going through oxidative phosphorylation who have uh, a much smaller amount of those reactive oxygen species necessary. So person uh, A in metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes is in a massive deficit of antioxidants because of the massive production of reactive oxygen species from that energy dysfunction. Person B who is metabolically healthy has plenty of antioxidants because they're not producing so many reactive oxygen species to create the same amount of ATP. Mitochondria are incredibly sensitive to oxidative balance. So person A will end up further damaging their mitochondria by having to produce uh, this ATP in this inefficient manner because the reactive oxygen species that they're producing through the energy uh, chain will end up going back into the mitochondria and damaging the very fragile DNA. The next thing that you know, you have mitochondria that are basically stuck in a permanent dysfunctional state. And the fascinating part of it is that they also are inhibited from mitophagy. So when you kind of look at what that means from a immunological perspective, the damaged mitochondria in the insulin resistant metabolic dysfunction individual leads to what we call permanent inflammasome activation, which is a pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic state with a handcuffed immune system because of a lack of antioxidants. And if you look at what happens to somebody with severe COVID, it is exactly that. It's viral persistence with a uncontrolled pro-thrombotic and pro-inflammatory state. So the metabolic conditioning equaling the mitochondrial conditioning equaling the immunological function is the linear progression of how someone with metabolic dysfunction means immunological dysfunction. And of course, we term this now immunometabolism because through our understanding of COVID, the link between metabolic health and immunological health has now been seen as one-to-one -one with the mitochondria at the center of that discussion. Well, that's a lot for us to chew on and digest. <laughs> And I um we'll we'll talk a little bit more about therapeutics, but I have to just ask because it sounded to me like some of these immunometabolic changes, it sounded like they were somewhat permanent. Can we get someone out of this cycle if we replete their antioxidants and we start to address the metabolic dysfunction? Can we reverse this and course correct? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's some something that uh, I've seen in my clinical practice and many other practitioners have seen in their clinical practice. One of the most important interventions for somebody that is suffering from long COVID is to not just fix their metabolic dysfunction, but take it to as close to perfection as you possibly can. And in doing so, you can restore mitophagy and by restoring mitophagy, you can clear out those damaged dysfunctional mitochondria and replace them with fresh, uh, newly functioning mitochondria that now have the capacity to go back into oxidative phosphorylation and, you know, basically reset this entire mess. So, um, you know, when, when you start diving into the literature and you say, well, what, what works for a long COVID? You know, um, everything that we preach is the foundation of functional medicine, which is lifestyle intervention. There's evidence there that it works already, which makes perfect sense when you look at the mechanisms. Okay, what a relief. And we're, we're going to come back to some of these lifestyle changes. But I want to work us through the kind of the therapeutic order here. So we've gathered our information. We've listened to our patient. We've heard their symptoms. We've heard their history. Now we should start doing a little bit of an assessment. Mm -hmm. Are there some 
biomarkers that we should order when the patient comes in, they're clearly having symptoms. We've talked about autoimmunity and metabolic dysfunction and um, chronic inflammation. When that patient comes into the office, what's on your lab order list? So uh, I, I think this is where you see that long COVID can be a, a mixture of many things and you've got to put on, you know, our appropriate Sherlock Holmes hat and ask the right questions and then get to the right data points. So it could be anything from cardiometabolic dysfunction, a chronic inflammatory immune dysfunctional state, as we mentioned, viral persistence of SARS-CoV-2. You have to look in some people, in fact, the majority of people for EBV and HHV6 viral reactivation. We hit on the gut dysbiosis portion of it and intestinal permeability. Um, there is a significant portion of long COVID patients who have speci uh, very specific neuroautoimmunity. So if you start kind of walking up the ladder here, the next steps beyond cardiometabolic health in general uh, you know, intestinal permeability, the things that I, I would consider the staples of functional medicine. If you need to, you start escalating the ladder into the specific mechanisms, which would be uh, uh, neuroautoimmunity, and then the mitochondrial dysfunction component, um, and then whether any other autoimmune diseases have been triggered by the infection itself. So forgive me, that's another very lengthy uh, explanation, but that just speaks to the complexity of what long COVID is. Nothing simple about it, right? No. So it sounds to me like there's a mixture of some blood work. And then in the setting of dysbiosis, is this a situation where a comprehensive stool analysis would be appropriate? I typically will do a comprehensive stool analysis along with some type of serological assay for zonulin, antibodies to zonulin, zonulin and LPS would be, you know, how I would cover the gut picture there, you know, the fasting triglycerides, insulin, glucose, or a good start on the metabolic side of things. Um, you know, and then if you're, if you're looking at the viral reactivation, make sure that the EBV and HHV6 panels are done to completion. You know, EBV is um, a little bit complicated. Most often it's an early antigen IgG that's going to be present, but that's not everything. And then with HHV6 and IgM and IgG level, um, and then from there, you can get even more complicated if you need to. We can we could keep adding things. What about something? I'm just thinking about even an HSCRP. Would that be indicated in this situation just to get a, an understanding of what's happening with inflammation? You know, I think that the the generalized inflammatory state can be persistent for some people, but it tends to be relatively low yield once you're getting three months out. I still order it on everybody, of course, because you know, uh, let's say the person has periodontal disease and you don't know about it, you're going to catch that with a persistently elevated CRP or something like that, right? So it's high yield, not always specifically relevant to long COVID, but maybe gives you some of the important antecedents. Right, right. This theme of mitochondrial dysfunction has come up again and again. And would you be willing to speak a little bit about this overlap between long COVID and what we might call chronic fatigue syndrome? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for those of us who have been involved in the research space for chronic fatigue syndrome, myalgic encephalitis, you know, I think that the uh, parallels between long COVID and CFS were apparent, I think, from the beginning. In other words, you know, I think most of the literature would argue that chronic fatigue syndrome was a spectrum disorder that had all these different pots in it, just like long COVID. And if you if you really want to break it down, it's probably virtually identical um, in as far as like all the different pieces that can be a part of CFS and then also looking at long COVID. Um, again, the bulk of CFS is, you know, kind of centered around the idea of a combination of mitochondrial dysfunction along with some type of chronic viral issue, whether it's viral persistence or viral reactivation. So those two themes definitely present within both of those. And, and I think the dominant theory in both of them. Well, let's now bring another condition into the mix because we're, we're drawing all these parallels. Is there a connection or some overlap between long COVID and mast cell activation syndrome? Great question. 
um, you know, mast cells being such a important primal and uh, uh, oftentimes as we see in functional medicine, unnecessarily aggressive part of the immune system, it makes very uh, logical sense that it's a big part of this. You know, I think when we see our mast cell patients, we're seeing a lot of brain fog, we're seeing a lot of fatigue, we're seeing a lot of gut issues. And, um, you know, that clinically overlaps with mast cell activation quite a bit. I think that there's one study that has been done that basically looked at the overlap of symptoms in mast cell patients and long COVID patients and, and um, uh, basically theorized based on those symptoms that it is likely a significant role player. Um, my biggest wish as both a clinician and researcher is that somebody one day develops a, a great mast cell activation panel out there so we could finally, you know, nail this diagnosis and not uh, just contemplate it, I think, as much as we do. Well, we'll put you to the task of <laughs> developing <laughs> that. We've talked about that on this show a couple of times, and our guests have always said, it's so hard to screen for and to diagnose, and that's one of the biggest limiting factors. So yes, we'll check back with you later to see if you've made progress on that front. From your clinical experience, Let's move into talking about some of these lifestyle-based approaches, because like you said, the functional medicine approach is particularly well-suited because we'll ask questions and remain curious, and we'll start with that foundation of lifestyle. So I'm, I'd like to, to touch on nutrition and exercise and sleep quality and all of these things we think about for a really well-rounded approach. But first, let's, let's be specific to the gut, because we've talked about the, the role of gut dysbiosis. What are some of your favorite strategies to support a healthy and diverse gut microbiome so that we can create some resiliency in our body knowing that viruses are out there? You know, I think um, oftentimes you're going to spend the majority of conversation trying to reshape what it is the individual puts inside of their body, right? You know, and, and to me, that's absolutely the highest yield. So, um, you know, I'm not sure what your clinical experience is, but mine is definitely that it takes uh, multiple visits to get people to continue to perfect and adopt the mindset that, you know, they're a complex machine and they need to be fueling themselves appropriately. But, you know, certainly if you want to consider the presumption that intestinal permeability is present in these long COVID patients, which I think is a good presumption and that dysbiosis is going to follow that, you know, uh, basically executing an anti-inflammatory diet, um, you know, like the core diet or a paleo diet or an autoimmune paleo diet, whatever your flavor of doing that is, you know, basically one that removes the common antigenic triggers of intestinal permeability, number one, and then number two provides a robust phytonutrient spectrum for the growth of the microbiome in a positive direction is paramount, right? You know, in doing that, you're going to heal intestinal permeability, you're going to support the growth of a healthy microbiome. And the fascinating part of doing that is that downstream from that is immune regulation, because remember, T regulatory cells in adults predominantly live in the gut mucosa. And from that immune regulation, you get mitochondrial restoration. So, you know, thinking of these kind of like gut centric diets as being gut centric, I think is uh, missing a little bit of the point that this is whole body immune or metabolic uh, metabolic intervention when you're executing these diets for people. So remove the inflammatory antigens. We all know them, gluten, dairy, grains like corn, you know, you can go on and on, you can personalize that, or you can do an elimination diet. And then from there, you know, um, we focus quite a lot on fiber as being fuel for the microbiome, but I think, you know, the appreciation for phytonutrients and antioxidants being incredibly potent prebiotics is, uh, I think, where we are now and I think where the future is going to be. So those nutrients from your veggies are where you get that. All right. Eat the rainbow. We'll keep going back to that advice. It's going to be a good one here for a variety of reasons. While we're exploring these lifestyle interventions, I, I want to get your thoughts on exercise because I have felt challenged by this before when we have a patient who comes in, they are already fatigued. And I know exercise will help them, but they are tired. And so that seems the fatigue itself is a mediator of their inactivity. What advice do you have when it comes to being physically active when you're dealing with long COVID or you're fatigued? <laughs> 
I agree with you. It's probably the biggest challenge on the clinical front. So hard. Um, yeah, I mean, you imagine, you know, try to have uh, some, some put yourself in their shoes and, and try to imagine the same situation. They're so tired, they don't really want to get out of bed. And you're telling them to, you know, go for a 30 minute jog. It's, it, it seems pretty unrealistic. But um, first of all, I educate them and say that there's literature that supports that even an exercise only approach can improve, if not fix, long COVID. Um, exercise uh, is so much more than I think what it looks like on the surface, right? It is brain supportive. You know, you get dopamine, it helps your mood. You know, you're already in a very difficult depressive state because of the long COVID. So it can help with your mindset. It relieves emotional stress. And the most potent inducer of immune precursor cells from the bone marrow has been proven to be weight-bearing exercise. So these people need as many immune stem cells as they get. So I tell them, listen, the only way that we're going to get those things that we need is we start exercising. And I, I give them a slowly escalating week-by-week -week program that's written out six weeks at a time and try to continue to escalate that for them as they're uh, tolerance uh, increases. You know, remember that mitochondropathy is at the center of this as well. And you know, what style of exercise really suits the mitochondria? It's going to be zone two or zone three exercise, which puts the least amount of oxidative stress on them while trying to help them rejuvenate. So, I will start them with something as simple as give me five minutes up and down the block, and then tomorrow give me six. And then the day after, give me seven and we'll just escalate that for a couple of weeks until they're walking for 30 minutes. Um, and then, you know, from there, just continue to try to ramp things up into a brisk walk, light jogging, yoga, you know, try to get the weight bearing in there at some point. You just have to start with the minimal that they're willing or capable to do and just very slightly increase it, get those hormetic stresses going and let them adapt to it. Very approachable. I'm a big fan of the zone two training. So that seems like a great plan. And I imagine that as they're more and more active, energy is improving, it's motivating, and they're able to kind of pick up on that momentum. So that's great. Let's let's keep layering on here and talk about sleep because we know in functional medicine, we know how important sleep is for our brain and our immune system. But do you find that you have to have this conversation quite regularly with patients who are dealing with viral illness or recovering from long COVID symptoms of refocusing on what seems to be a simple intervention, it's sleep. Absolutely. Uh, it's probably one of the most common disturbances that you'll see in, in the post-COVID state, even acutely post-COVID, people have dramatic sleep disturbances. And, and um, again, the first thing I do is try to educate them. And I'll say, listen, you know, COVID has a very significant neuroinflammatory component. In addition to that, sometimes, it, let's say, it triggers viral reactivation or neuroautoimmunity. Those are their own contributors to this neuroinflammatory state. This is something that is physically happening to you. Unfortunately, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, if you continue the sleep deprivation, it makes everything much worse. So we've got to do something to make sure that we're pushing against that. So I preach, obviously... Uh, sleep hygiene to its max in these people, you know, blue light blocking glasses after seven, nothing stimulating, try to only read, keep away from screens. That's not always possible, but, you know, I'll try to do that with everybody. Um, some type of mindful meditation practice immediately before going to sleep. And then I'll, I think a lot of times people will need sleep supportive supplements in this situation, theanine, magnesium, melatonin, which has the dual purpose of being, you know, immune regulatory as well as helping them to restore their sleep. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like poor sleep habits make you more susceptible to viral illness. And then the neuroinflammation that results from COVID-19 infection can then further exacerbate sleep deprivation. Is that correct? Absolutely. Wow. We really got to get sleeping, everyone. <laughs> We've covered some really important lifestyle factors. Now let's talk about supplements. Are there some supplements? You mentioned a few that you're using for sleep, but are there some that you're using with regularity to address things like micronutrient insufficiencies or just frank deficiencies that might play into the prolonging of COVID symptoms? 
Yeah, I think that there are some that are so well documented that they're, you know, uh, to me a little bit shocking that they're not universally applied. I mean, the data surrounding vitamin D3 deficiency, um, you know, and not only susceptibility to COVID, but long COVID is, you know, concrete at this point. So obviously you're maximizing vitamin D levels. Uh, you know, we could argue what that would be, but certainly, you know, well above what's considered a, a low normal would be better for them from an immune perspective. Um, the next place I go to after that are these really wonderful multifaceted mitochondrial support products that are out there now in the functional medicine world. You know, again, consider that, you know, immunometabolism is at the center of post COVID and mitochondria are the, you know, the focal point of that. If you're providing mitochondria with the nutrients that they need, they're going to be in a better situation. They're going to produce less reactive oxygen species, their function will be better um, and, and immune stress will decrease following that. So I'm typically as a second layer putting them on, you know, one of the companies out there who have uh, a great mitochondrial multivitamins, uh, you know, acetyl L-carnitine, ALA, ALA uh, you know, CoQ10, PQQ, all the things that mitochondria love. Um, you know, usually after that, I'm, I'm tailoring it to what the personalized investigation really says are the important buckets for them. So, you know, make the presumption that they've got the mitochondrial deficiency. And from there, what are the unique pieces of their long COVID and fix that? If it's metabolic, you know, I'm all for giving supplements that can help improve insulin resistance like berberin. If it's viral reactivation, you know, you want their T cells and their natural killer cells functioning as strongly as they possibly can. So, you know, stragalus, echinacea, you know, elderberry, mushroom extracts, vitamin C, zinc, quercetin, NAC. We've got a lot of things in our toolbox in that front. Um, and then if it's the gut stuff, you know, uh, lots of things that can be used in that space. My personal favorite is uh, using serum bovine immunoglobulins. Yes. So many tools in this toolbox in terms of lifestyle. And we've got our supplements. Now, I'm just coming freshly off of a large integrative health conference and an exhibit hall full of the fanciest high-tech things that we could choose from. Is there a role um, for some of these hormetic therapies like sauna and red light and hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Give us your, your sense of if those things should be part of our plan. Isn't this like such a fun time to be practicing in this space? It's like a, it's a, a, fun a time new to tool. Be alive. It is a really fun time, you know? Yeah. I mean, if, if someone is perfecting all of the important foundations of functional medicine and they want to do more, we have those conversations for sure. Um, you know, I think that there's enough robust literature centered around sauna that it it seems to fit the long COVID picture really well because it has that immunometabolic benefit for people. You know, cold exposure probably, you know, got less data to it, but people love it. It certainly has a humongous dopamine response afterwards. And a lot of times that just gets people engaged and going and feeling good. Um, hyperbarics too, they've got, you know, uh, their own early data in that space. Red light therapy is probably a little bit behind, but so many people just swear by it anecdotally. These are all things that when people, you know, when I've given them an A report card for everything else that they're doing, and you know, I'll say, okay, now we can move on to other things if you want to. Um, and there are even fancier things out there. You know, uh, a lot of people are using methylene blue as a hormetic stressor in this space, right? Um, I'm aware of many people getting cultured mesenchymal stem cells now for long COVID with some anecdotal clinical success. It's just never ending. It's never ending. My personal group chat with my doctor friends is full of uh, conversation about methylene blue. So I'm glad you brought that up. But I like where you took this, that we're going to focus on the foundations and then the strategies that are well-researched and we've been using them and they're tried and true. And then, of course, there's always something to up the ante if we want to. And I think that that's very well said. Uh, all of these things, uh, I think the ultimate goal is that we create resiliency in our immune health, immune resiliency. And will you take a moment and just describe to us what that means to you? Is it that you you can engage in the world and you can encounter whatever pathogens, but you're able to overcome them and, and return to homeostasis or what will you just 
define that term as you interpret it? Yeah, absolutely. Immune resiliency is having their their reservoir to be able to meet the stressors of the environment and be able to recover to your baseline without issue, if you just want to break it down to its most simplistic Mm -hmm. definition. I think it's pretty evident that we've lost that um, recently in society, even more evident, I think, since COVID has come around. I mean, you know, um, we're filled with stories in the clinical space, I'm sure you are too, with viral infections that didn't really seem to be such a big deal before, you know, RSV comes to mind, right? You know, RSV was something that obviously children struggled with, but hearing about RSV being so devastating to adults um, is relatively new. I mean, I have patients who have what I call long RSV now in the clinic. They basically look exactly like long COVID patients, but RSV was the documented trigger. And, um, that all speaks to a lack a lack of immune resilience and inability to rebound from the stressor you're facing. Mm-hmm. So as we think about all of these drivers for lack of resiliency in our immune system and these predisposing factors, what can we do in terms of prevention? You've mentioned a lot of things with metabolic health and inflammation and autoimmunity, but if we want to start making the right choices to have a protective effect on our health, what can we do for prevention now? I, I, I think it goes back to those basics again. It's boring, you know, I think to kind of hit on sleep and movement and connecting with people, taking care of yourself, eating well, you know, but you have to be a master of those things, I think, in today's world. It's just the reality. We are getting hit with more environmental insults than ever before as a species. And the only way to meet that threat is to up your game. And you have to do it across the board. Up your immune game. I like that. What's what do you, what's something that you do? It doesn't have to be the most important thing, but what is one thing that you do for your own health to promote immune resiliency in your own body? I'm a fanatic about um, sleep, diet, and exercise. I mean, if, if um, it, you know, I think a lot of people would comment if they saw how much I am a fanatic about those things, but um, I know a lot of clean eaters and I'm definitely the cleanest among them. And I, I'm religious about exercise and religious about sleep. I do very much practice what I preach. I think those things are the most important. Uh, since I've done well in those realms. I do sauna and cold plunge every day as well, too. And I love them to death. But uh, those to me are just icing on the cake. Icing on the cake, certainly. Well, for any of our listeners who are feeling excited about this topic, what do you hope that our listeners will take away from this episode as they head back into the real world? I think the most important thing is that, you know, there's no magic bullet or magic diagnosis for long COVID. You know, I I think we've seen over the last few years, people kind of bring that up, especially in the clinical offering space. Like, you know, there's one thing, one test, one drug, one this, one that, you know, we know in functional medicine that things don't work that way. Long COVID is no different. It, it, there's no magical answer. You've got to just get to the work the way that we do. If you have a roadmap of all of the possibilities, it helps to narrow that. So I hope that this helps people kind of understand specific areas they need to look into if they're troubleshooting. But overall, this is um, just another example of us doing our work in functional medicine and, and the answers will come from that. I really took that away as I was listening. It seems like the best way to take care of ourselves either before or after a COVID infection is to bolster and build fortitude within all of our body systems. So like you said, we can meet these challenges and return to balance. Would you say that's true? That is absolutely true. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Vojdani, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing of these clinical insights and your experience. We know that you'll keep an eye on the emerging research on this topic and we'll look to your expertise and you'll continue to share all of the most important and relevant clinical information with us. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Discover the latest research and innovative clinical practices at IFM's annual international conference, May 29th through June 1st, 2024 at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. For more information, visit aic.ifm.org.